our next speaker is Max Kaplan. Um, Max is also a 2017 Canals Executive Fellow in NOAA's Ocean Acidification Program. He did his PhD in Biological Oceanography in the MIT Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution Joint Program at Oceanography. Um, and before that, he completed a Bachelor's of Science in Marine Biology at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. Um, and while at Huey, Max actually had a recreational lobster license and caught over 200 lobsters for fun and suffering. <laughs> so for that, let's welcome Max. Thank you, and thanks uh, everyone for coming. I'd like to share some of my PhD research with you today on uh, sound production by marine animals and the relationship between sounds and the species assemblages we observe on coral reefs. And this was work uh, done in collaboration with my PhD advisor, Aaron Mooney, and a couple of uh, my collaborators out in Hawaii, uh, Mark Lammers and Eden Zhang. And to start with, I just want to say that variability is a defining component of the marine environment. And in this Stommel diagram, we see some things that I'm sure are familiar to everyone. Um, on the x-axis, we have uh, time. On the y-axis, we have space. And then biomass variability on the z-axis. And some of the features are familiar. We have uh, diurnal vertical migrations things that happen on annual cycles, and then uh, events that happen on longer time scales, such as El Nino type events. And hopefully what I convey to you today is that uh, sound production by marine animals also varies on many of these time scales. And uh, I'd like to share with you some of the insights that we can gain from studying that variability. Uh, sound production is diverse across taxa. I'm showing you just a few sniferous or sound producing animals here. Uh, the urchin, the snapping shrimp, fish, and obviously whales. And in my research I focus mostly on snapping shrimp and fish. And so I want to just tell you a little bit about the sound production of snapping shrimp first. Um, before we uh, listen to some snapping shrimp, I just want to introduce you to a few figures that we'll see some of later. So uh, first we have, this is the waveform, or the, the time domain of the snap. It's a broadband impulsive sound, normalized amplitude on the y-axis and time on the x. Uh, then we have in the frequency domain, the power spectrum. And what we can see from this is that the peak frequency is around 7 kilohertz. So again, the frequency on, on the uh, x-axis power on the Y. And then finally we have a spectrogram showing a single snap. So this again is time on the X axis, frequency on the Y, and then intensity in the Z or the color axis. And uh, why don't we listen to some of those snaps now. Very good. So there's a, there's a fish that played in the background, but we'll hear more of them later. Don't worry. Um, so that sound uh, that you hear, which kind of sounds like bacon frying, um, is actually the sound of the collapse of a cavitation bubble, which forms during the closure of this enlarged, uh, enormous claw. Uh, there are around maybe 200, maybe more species of snapping shrimp on coral reefs. They're incredibly diverse, highly cryptic. Uh, very difficult to study. And we don't know a lot about why they actually produce sound. Uh, there might be an influence of light and temperature. And I'll speak a little bit more about that uh, later on. So now I want to share with you the sounds produced by another major taxonomic group. And this is really where I focused my research on. These are the sounds produced by fish. Um, I have here four spectrograms of four different fish that I recorded in the US Virgin Islands. And uh, perhaps we can listen to them now. So there's there's one. That's this guy right here. This one, finally. So as you can tell, those are a lot more variable in terms of uh, what they sound like. And also when you look at the spectrograms, they look a lot different. Um, in many ways, fish have a lot more uh, flexibility in terms of the sounds they produce. Many of the sounds are produced uh, by muscles associated with the gas-filled sac uh, known as the swim bladder. 
Um, but I guess like this all, they're physiologically constrained by the maximum firing rate of the muscles, and so fish sounds tend to be much lower frequency than the broadband shrimp snaps. And that actually serves us well from an analysis perspective because we see this clear spectral partitioning between the fish sounds, which are predominantly low frequency, so below 1,000 hertz, and the shrimp snaps, which are much higher frequency but broadband, uh, mostly between 2 and 20 kilohertz. And, and that allows us to really separate out these frequency bands, talk about the fish band, the low frequency band, and the snapping shrimp band, the higher frequencies. I mentioned that sound production varies in space and time, and what I want you to take away from this, this is a snapping shrimp, so it's a snap count on the y-axis by four times a day on the x. This is during winter from a temperate reef um, during two lunar periods. And we see a clear crepuscular influence with elevated snap rates at dawn and dusk during both the new moon and the full moon, but there's also a clear lunar influence, much higher snap rates. Uh, during the new moon. I mentioned earlier that light might play a role, and, and I'm sure that's exactly what you're thinking when you look at this. Well, there's different light availability for the snapping shrimp during the various lunar periods and also during the crepuscular periods compared to other times of day. Uh, sound production also varies in space. What I'm showing you here are two power spectra. So again, this is uh, power on the y-axis and frequency on the x-axis. Uh, the red one is a reef from Panama, and the blue is a reef uh, in Florida. These are relatively short recordings. And I'm sure what you're thinking when you look at this is like, well, what is actually driving these differences? Is it a question of instrumentation? Is the propagation environment different? Or is it an influence of who or what is actually making sound on these, on these two, two reefs? And, and a number of people have been interested in answering that question. This is a relatively early study in this field looking at the relationship between broadband sound level on the y-axis and coral cover on the x. And we see this positive, but um, uh, forgive the use of the word, somewhat noisy relationship. Um, and you might think, well, this makes sense. Higher coral cover, there might be more animals uh, living on that reef that make sound. Uh, why not? But I would just point out to you that these recordings are very short. They're about two-minute long recordings collected during the day. I've already hinted at the fact that the crepuscular times of day might be important. And so I would argue that this study and similar studies that have come since then miss a substantial amount of the variability we get over even slightly longer time scales. And to demonstrate that, what I'm showing you here is this waterfall plot. So this is like a three-dimensional spectrogram showing on the y-axis frequency uh, time, so a 24-hour period on the x-axis, and then intensity on the, on the z and also in the color axis. And what we see is that you would get a pretty different result from this reef if you recorded it, say, during 6 a.m. or 6 p.m. compared to during the uh, day. So I would posit that looking at this variability, even over relatively short periods of time scales, it is critical to quantifying the sound production uh, on a reef. And so two main questions here. Uh, what are the dominant periods of biological sound production on coral reefs? And does the biological soundscape reflect species assemblages present on the reef? And so hopefully we'll come up with some answers to those questions. I want to share with you first some of the results of a study that I conducted, a uh, pilot project in the U.S. Virgin Islands National Park. We instrumented three reefs for about a four-month period with acoustic recording devices. I'm showing you this one here. This is a device we developed at Hui. Um, the three reefs here on the south side of St. John in the National Park, they varied in coral cover and uh, fish density. And the point there was to get a gradient of reefs and look at how the soundscapes might vary among them. We collected uh, visual survey results. Uh, at the high frequencies, we see something slightly different. Uh, we see a pretty similar trend in terms of the sound production, again, pooled over the deployment period with these clear peaks at dawn less so at dusk, uh, but the levels between these are different. And so what we did was we looked at the magnitude of this diel trend in sound production. So the height of the peak at the crepuscular periods compared to a low point, say at midnight, and compared that to the visual survey parameters that we collected. I'm just showing you here the comparison between coral cover and the strength of this diel trend at dawn and dusk. 
And then we see some relationship here, again, with quite substantial variability between coral cover and the strength of this diode trend. Uh, less so at the high frequencies for the snapping shrimp. And if you think about it, that kind of makes sense because you wouldn't necessarily expect snapping shrimp abundance or acoustic activity to relate to live coral cover. So this was an interesting result, but uh, it was fairly limited in terms of the number of reefs, in terms of the uh, time over which we recorded them, and also importantly in terms of the gradient of coral cover and fish density among the reefs. And so we tried to address all of those um, deficiencies as well as increasing the duty cycle. So this is the percentage of time that we were recording. In this initial study, we were doing that for about 1% uh, of the time, which is fairly limited. And I'll get into later why that's important. So we went to Hawaii. Uh, we increased the number of reefs from 3 to 7, uh, much greater spatial extent, so from the northwest corner of Maui to uh, the southwest corner. And the reefs were uh, substantially more variable. I'll show you those results in a moment. We used a slightly different acoustic recording instrument. This is called an ecological acoustic recorder, shown here. And lest you think that it was all fun being out in Hawaii, mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to make a small digression here to note that we actually had a, a lot of trouble with boats out there. So this is my collaborator, Mark, uh, seemingly triumphantly holding up some part of the uh, spark plug system mm -hmm which we thought was broken. Well, it was, but as, as was much of the rest of the engine. We spent hours trying to get his boat working. But actually, people were uh, pretty generous, and so um, someone just gave us his boat to use for the rest of the time. So it all worked out uh, fairly well. It was really a great place to work. We conducted four visual surveys over the 16-month period. Um, and I'm showing you here the benthic cover uh, results. So for each of the seven reefs, we have uh, one, two, three, four surveys. What I want you to take away from this is that the coral cover, live coral cover in dark uh, blue or purple here, uh, varied fairly substantially among the reefs. And I want to highlight this one. Well, this isn't really a reef at all. It's a sand patch that we use as sort of a control site. Uh, the reef with the highest coral cover was uh, Molokini. And then uh, I suppose Honolulu was the one with the lowest uh, other than the control site. I also want to highlight this third survey. Well, this happened in October of 2015 uh, during a, a major bleaching event in the Hawaiian Islands. So what we see is that at some of these reefs, particularly the ones with highest coral cover, there was a substantial uh, component of bleached coral, which largely recovered by the next survey, uh, which was in January of 2016. In terms of the fish, I've split this up uh, into siniferous, and it, it shouldn't really say non-siniferous, it should say I guess, potentially siniferous, because we don't know that they don't make any sound. Uh, roughly split at all of the reefs between siniferous and, and these other fish. What we see here is that, again, at the sandy control site, very few fish. But, but there's a lot more variability here in terms of the fish surveys uh, at each of these reefs, within reefs, over time. And I think that will become important uh, shortly. I want to show you first here the sound levels over the entire 16-month deployment period. Uh, this is just at one reef. We see the substantial, oops, we see the substantial increase in low frequencies during the winter time. And if any of you have been or spent time in Hawaii in the winter, you know that this is because there are about 10,000 humpback whales there, and they're singing. And so this increases the sound level by about 20 decibels. Um, which is really bad if we're interested in fish sound, because there's a huge overlap there spectrally. We really can't look at the fish sound production uh, during this period of time, say from December until May. And, and so as a result, we're really only going to be looking at the fish sounds at the other times uh, of the deployment. At the high frequencies, we don't have that problem, uh, because the humpback song is so low frequency. So we can look at the shrimp snapping activity uh, for the entire deployment period. I point out here that we see a slight decrease in sound level during the winter time, and then a slight increase through the summer and fall. And uh, I'm not showing you this in this presentation, but this is very tightly linked to temperature. And so the snap activity or the snap sound levels tend to increase with water temperature and then decrease in the winter time when the water cools off. All right, so we've talked a lot about the timing of sound production. And I want to show you here how that is impacted over the entire deployment period. So what I'm showing you for each reef is 
the 24-hour period on the y-axis, the entire deployment period on the x, I'm showing you dawn and dusk here with these red and blue lines respectively. And then the dot is the timing of the peak sound level in a given day. And I'm also showing you what that level is using this color bar here. So a couple things. Uh, one, when the humpbacks are around, that's when the highest sound levels of the entire deployment are, as we've discussed. Um, there is some fidelity to the crepuscular periods in terms of when the timing of the peak is, but, but that varies a lot. And in general, there's a substantial amount of variability here uh, at some of these reefs. You have the timing of the peak really at, at all times of day. It's a slightly different story at the high frequencies. We see a lot more fidelity to the crepuscular periods. You know, at, at this one reef, there's not a single time of, there's not a single day, sorry, where a peak level happens outside of the dawn and dusk uh, night period. Um, although there is variability at some of these other sites, there's a really strong relationship here to dawn and dusk. So what I'm showing you again here are the median levels over the entire deployment period for the two frequency bands. Focusing first on the low frequency, what we see here is that this, uh, the shape of this diode period is actually pretty different across reefs. I'll just point to a couple to give you an example. This one here, Molokini, you have a much broader um, increase and then subsequent decrease at the dawn period and then the same again at dusk, whereas at some of these other reefs, you have a slightly less pronounced uh, crepuscular period. And if you think about what is actually driving this, we're doing a study here at the community level. This is the compilation of all of the animals that are producing sound around this period. And so if the species assemblages vary, you might hypothesize that the shape of that increase would vary. At high frequencies, we see something completely different. Basically, there's a very low level during the day and then a much higher level uh, at night with these major uh, rates of change at the dawn and the dusk period, uh, really at all of these reefs. Now, I'm sure you're wondering how this diel periodicity compares in strength to something else like lunar periodicity, for example. And so what I'm showing you here for one reef is a uh, power spectrum of the time series at each uh, frequency band. At the low frequencies, we see that the major period is once a day with a slightly smaller peak at twice a day. Really, the diode period is very strong here. There's a very small lunar component, but really the diode periodicity is, is, what, is um, what matters here. At the high frequencies, really this once a day peak is uh, what's important. We again have a slightly, um, slightly larger than at low frequencies lunar component not really uh, even close to the same magnitude. So before, when we were looking at quantifying the strength of the diel trend, the magnitude of that diel increase, we just did a simple difference between peak and some low point. One of the reasons we had to do that was because the sampling um, uh, rate or the duty cycle was actually quite low. We didn't have a lot of time points. We increased the um, duty cycle in this study by an order of magnitude, so it was a 10% duty cycle, which if you think about it, produces a substantial amount of fish and snapping shrimp sounds over a 16-month period at seven reefs. Um, but it also gives us a much finer scale shape of this diel period. So what I'm showing you here, just for illustrative purposes, is the median low frequency sound pressure level for one month uh, at one reef. And what we can do is zoom in on this dawn and dusk crepuscular period, stitch it together, normalize it so the low point is at zero, and then integrate the space under that curve, so compute the area under the curve. That gives us a lot more fine scale detail about the various nuances of how sound production might change over the course of the crepuscular period. And so that's exactly what we did. What we're looking at here is something similar to what I showed you for the U.S. Virgin Islands, but I'm showing you the relationship between the area under the curve and rugosity, or three-dimensional structure, coral cover, and soniferous fish abundance. This is at low frequencies. What we see here is the only significant relationship is uh, at one of the two sampling periods that we could include for the fish sounds, uh, significant relationship between soniferous fish abundance and this area under the curve metric. When we move to high frequencies, 
we actually see a strong relationship between the high frequency area under the curve and coral cover uh, for three of the four sampling periods, but uh, not for either rugosity or coniferous fish abundance. So to summarize this, we do see these strong links between the species assemblages and um, uh, diel periodicity of sound production. Um, um, this is an interesting relationship. It's confirmatory to the results that we saw in the U.S. Virgin Islands, but um, fleshed out a lot more uh, with this more comprehensive study. I would just say that this is really, as I mentioned, a study at the community level. We're not drilling down into the sound production of any individual species, but we have the ability to do that. And so I just want to end by showing you that there's a huge diversity of fish behaviors uh, that are associated with sounds. This is from a catalog of fish sound production uh, in Hawaii, actually. And, and there are just a number of behaviors in, in which fish produce sound. Vigilance, schooling, uh, courtship, uh, agonistic interactions, and so on. And what we can do, and what we, we are doing, is actually drilling down into the acoustic records alongside our visual survey records and looking at the occurrence patterns of individual sound, uh, sound producers behaviors that they're associated with and how that changes over time. So uh, stay, stay tuned for that and I'll end there and thank you very much for listening. Go ahead. Uh, question, so the propagation of sound, you know, obviously is an artifact and part of the physical chemical So when you look at comparing the different sites, presumably all of those terms in terms of temperature effects or salinity effects are probably pretty well mathematically constrained at this time. Is there a way of normalizing all of that data so that you can back out any of that abiotic factor that might be altered properly? Yeah, um, the question's about uh, how the propagation environment might differ uh, among the reefs. That's something we thought a lot about in designing this study. And uh, I don't know about normalizing it, but what we did to try to avoid that being an issue was, uh, as I showed the location of the reefs, they were all on the same side of the island, in the lead of the island. So uh, wind speeds were fairly similar. That can also influence the um, abiotic sound although not necessarily propagation. They were all up against the coast, and so in terms of the propagation environment, not really any of them were out in the middle. Molokini, I guess, a little bit, which is a crater, but it was also protected on one side. So by choosing our sites in the way that we did, we tried to limit the influence of the propagation. Like no, actually, the temperature was pretty similar. We had temperature loggers on all of these uh, reefs, all the, all the instruments as well. and. Um, there were no real differences, no appreciable differences in how temperature changed over time. Um, the other component of that, which I'm not sure you asked about, but I'll take this opportunity to share anyway, <laughs> is that um, fish sounds in particular are fairly, um, have fairly low source level. They're not high amplitude. And people who study this think that the active space of fish communication is on the order of meters. And so these sounds aren't traveling all that far anyway. And so we believe, and we've done some uh, tests to um, confirm this, that what we're recording from, in terms of the biological sounds is really a localized environment around the recorder. One of the studies we did in the US Virgin Islands was we put out a bunch of recorders uh, relatively closely spaced. And you saw some differences in the individual sounds being produced. But the overall trend on a given reef was very similar, and then it differed among reefs. Yeah. Well, I have two questions. Well, actually, one comment and one question. So what I've heard about that snapper train, um, sometimes they make sound by shooting out this super fast water jet out of their snappers to kill the prey. Um, I thought that was really cool, um, and that's why they make this sound. It's like the X-Men have super <laughs> 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 So, yeah, that's something I want to share. And I guess um, my question is, like, um, is on so what? Like, how do you think that your study kind of influenced 
policy making. I mean, I understand like the human activity, the salmon frequency is very similar to the fish, but as you just said, the sound doesn't travel very far, it's very local. So how do you think um, your city can influence the policy making? Sure, that's a good question. Um, I guess one specific thing and then one general thing. I guess the, the question the question is about the the so what of this work. Um, first, let's talk about masking. So even if the fish sounds don't travel that far, that doesn't mean that anthropogenic sound doesn't travel far. Certainly boat noise, low frequency boat, boat noise can travel quite far. And the question of masking I think is an important one. This specific work that I talked about today doesn't really get at that. Some of my other work has looked at um, the propagation of uh, boat noise, how shipping noise might increase over time. Um, that's sort of the other side of this. You know, to do this work, it actually requires you to go through in a semi, semi manual, I would say, way and excise the anthropogenic noise. Because it might be that some reefs are more uh, visited by boats, so they happen to be in more um, active shipping lanes, stuff like this. So you actually have to remove all of that. But in doing so, you can study how that changes the, the soundscape. So that's something that, that we have done. In, in terms of the specific uh, so what of this work, um, monitoring reefs is really expensive. And so one of the ideas behind this is if you can track the current <laughs> patterns of a individual species using a semi-automatic method, say with a detection algorithm on one of these instruments. And, and that's actually happening. And, and that's a fairly low cost way of tracking changes over time uh, on a given reef. I have a question. Go for it. Um, so the masking concern is that if you have the increased anthropogenic noise, that then they will be hearing each other for a or... Exactly. Right. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, a counterpoint to that, so, so that is what people, that is, that is a concern. It's a concern for whales as well as uh, fish. Um, the counterpoint to that, so, something which I think is a legitimate question and not adequately studied, in part because it's hard to do, is, well, what about the wintertime in Maui when you have all these humpback whales? where the song is basically constant. It raises the noise floor by 20 dB, which is a huge amount since it's a logarithmic measure. Well, can the fish just not communicate with each other in the winter? I mean, surely not, right? And so I think that this is a, is a tough question of, of what the influence of masking is um, on a uh, life history perspective. It's hard to study. People are interested in that, but it's a, it's a tough one. Questions from the chat. Is there a biological clock driving the heightened activity at the muscular periods, or is this an increase in activity holding a function of light? Um, yeah, good question. Um, I don't think we have enough information to say whether it's just light or just a biological clock. I imagine it's uh, something to do with both. Uh, certainly, many fish become more active at night. Uh, a lot of that is to do with light, n night light levels. Um, we also do see some differences between the new moon and the full moon, and so there's obviously a light influence there. Um, but I think it's sort of hard to disentangle, like, why is an animal nocturnal? Like, is it just light, or is it is it a nocturnal animal? Um, yeah, I don't think I have a good answer for that. Yes, another question. Does the absence of sound indicate an absence of could the sound levels for specific species like snapping shrimp be monitored and correlated with stress or mortality that might be attributed to impacts from a passing or ongoing oil spill? Um, potentially. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know. Um, I guess I'll answer the first part. So, an absence of sound definitely doesn't mean there's an absence of biological activity. I showed you that around half of the fish that we observed on our reefs are known to be ciniferous. So that gives you a pretty good example of how ubiquitous sound production might be among fishes. But that's not to say that they're producing sound at all times. You know, those sounds are tied to certain behaviors, uh, which might vary by season, certainly by time of day. Um, and so I wouldn't argue that you could all you have to do is put out an acoustic recorder, and then you'll have a really good assessment of what's 
on the reef. I think from a community level perspective and from targeting individual species, it has real utility though. So you mentioned, and I think rightly so, that this represents the community, but almost more than that, it's also the interactions going on within that community, right? Um, and so I'm curious about the assumption that it would be a linear relationship between abundance and noise or sound, because you might expect that as when there are more animals, there's going to be you know an amplification of sound because there's more interactions going on, whereas when there are a few, there might not be sort of a linear relationship, and I'm curious about that. Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting point. Um, I think the counterpoint to that is that what we're doing is we're integrating over a relatively long period of time. So the dawn and dusk period is about an hour and a half period of time that's being integrated over. And what we observe is to some extent some spectral and temporal niche partitioning among the fish, uh, sound producing fishes. So, you know, not all fish not all fishes might make sound at the same time, and indeed they don't. And you do see characteristic peaks at different times of that crepuscular period um, where different animals are starting to produce sound or the different contexts under which they're producing sound. Thanks. Thanks.